afternoon, everyone, um, and uh, welcome to our webinar, um, The Future of Work and Impact on the Financial Planner. Um, we're going to give it just a minute or so just to get um, everyone, as many people, onto the onto the call. Uh, and then I'm just going to introduce uh, Rob, introduce myself, and just talk a little bit about um, what we plan to, to do over the next 45 minutes. Paul, um, uh, and welcome from uh, from 10x Investments. Uh, great to have you all on this call and what I think is going to be a fascinating uh, webinar and presentation from Rob. Um, I'll introduce Rob in a second, but I think most of you will know will know Rob. Um, but the plan for today is for Rob to do a 30-minute uh, presentation. Um, we're keen to have around 15 minutes or so on on Q and A. So so what we'll do is they'll see a Q&A tool um, on your screen. If you have questions during the presentation, I'll be able to see them and I'll collate those questions um, and then use the last 15 minutes for, for Rob and I to have a chat um, around the presentation. Uh, the call is going to be uh, recorded uh, and we'll send that all through to you um, via, via email afterwards. Um, so I don't think Rob needs much of an introduction. So Rob, I'm going to do a short one and um, and describe, I guess, what's been a, a you know a distinguished career in a very short couple of paragraphs. So, um, but I think firstly, just to say, Rob is is head of strategic advisory services at Fundhouse, where he consults to coaches and trains both individuals and teams in financial planning and uh, and asset management. Um, he's had several uh, senior executive roles over the year. Um, over the years and has written and spoken widely on a number of um, key topics from leadership through to behavior coaching, investments, and financial planning. He's co-authored the book, uh, Rethinking Leadership, and uh, Rob will intro and talk to his book. He recently launched The Seven Pillars of uh, Financial Health, partnering with a professional um, to thrive. Rob, I mean, I think the, the topic is a, is, a, is a massive one. Um, both of these, I think you could, uh, you could cover it at, at length. But obviously, our lives have changed massively um, with COVID, and in particular, how we work and how we interact. And, and some of it's going back to normal, and some of it isn't. Um, so definitely, are um, fascinating times that that we that we live in. And I'm I'm super keen, as as I'm sure the audience is, just to understand how you see that, and in particular, just how that actually impacts um, the financial planner. I'm going to go on on mute and kill my camera uh, for the next half an hour, and then I'll I'll be back on. So Rob, I'm going to hand it over to you to to lead. Thanks. Great. Thank, thanks very much, Anton. Thanks for that introduction and, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you um, and uh, and then kick off uh, with the presentation. Um, as Anton said, um, the, the topic that we're going to deal with today is the future of work and its impact on the financial planner. And, um, and as Anton said, I mean, this is a massive topic. Uh, just the future of work, and we could take it from many angles and probably spend a day talking about it. Um, but I am going to try and address it to a certain extent, um, um, and I'm going to kick off with the question, you know, what what is the future of work? You know, what does that look like for us? Um, but I think that uh, when we look into the future, it's also important for us to understand where we've come from. And uh, in, in that regard, I'm going to show a couple of images here and wonder if anybody recognizes any of these images. Um, and maybe if you do recognize them, I think you're able to type into the chat box um, what you see in front of you. Um, but uh, it would be interesting to see if anybody recognizes those. And, and if you do type into the chat box what you see. Um, but essentially, my question to you is, if you put those three items together, uh, what do you get? Um, you, you got a typewriter, a camera, and uh, a Walkman. And um, and the question for you to answer is, what do you get? And I, I'm not sure if you're able to type into the chat box or into the Q&A box to answer that question, but I'm sure that all of you would have guessed that what you get is a cell phone. And, and the remarkable thing is, is that a cell phone is, um, Stephen says he's used those things all his life um, uh, and, and, and now a cell phone. That's fantastic, Stephen. Um, but the key thing about a cell phone is that it's no, not just a typewriter, a camera, and a Walkman. You know, you can do anything you want to on it, whether it be banking, booking, betting, you know, informing yourself on absolutely, absolutely anything, shopping. And then some of you might even be Zooming on that at the moment. And, and really what we have with the cell phone is the first indication of what the future of work is about. And the future of work is about being mobile. 
Um, and, and the reason that that's possible is because these cell phones enable us to have essentially all the world's information and media online. It means that we can go anywhere at any time and reach anyone anywhere at any time. And, and in essence, we have this powerful supercomputer in our pockets, uh, which enable this mobility, which is going to characterize the future of work. And we got a real taste of that during the pandemic. Um, this image is familiar to all of you, given that you are actually participating on a Zoom call right now. Um, and, and essentially, the flexibility and hybrid work that we saw mushroom during COVID is here to stay. Uh, Dr. Nick Bloom of Stanford University is a specialist in, in looking at different forms of work. Um, and he cited the fact that in 1965, only 1% 1 of people worked from home. In 2019, before the pandemic started, 5% of people worked from home. During the pandemic, that went to 61.5% of people worked from home. And now we're at, at a level of around 30% of people working from home. So dramatic change from uh, 1965. Um, and, and we're seeing that it, it, it benefits a number of different things like startups, outsourcing, offshoring, different activities that people engage in, in through their work. And we're also seeing offices being transformed with cubicles and meeting rooms now becoming dominant. Um, and Nick Bloom in his research also cites the fact that in the US, midweek golfing has surged as a result of this flexibility that is the second element of the future of work. It's mobile, it's flexible, so there are huge benefits, but obviously the one challenge with that is it does have some- Scandals happen all the time. The question is how do democracies respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for, uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift, shifting, shifting sands in the region, do you think relations with the North may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the, um, pardon me. Sorry, pardon me. My apologies. <laughs> What is this going to be for the region? My apologies. North, uh, sorry. Um, North Korea, North, uh, South Korea's policy choices on North Korea have been severely limited in the last six months to a year. Because so it's amazing that he was able to carry on talking about North Korea and possibilities of, of nuclear war, etc. While there was a nuclear war going in the background, but as we can see, the future of work has its risks. And that's one of the risks, but that's a minor risk compared to, to this risk. Um, PwC in their global workforce survey last year identified the fact that there are many workers who are concerned that technology will place their roles. 30% um, of the overall workforce they surveyed, 52,000 people, are concerned that their role will be replaced by technology. And obviously different generations fear this um, with the younger generation fearing it more than the older generation. But the key thing is, is that technology is on the rise. And in some ways, it's a, it's a tough opponent for human beings. On the other hand, it might be a great assistant for us. Um, I'm sure you don't need an introduction to, to Mark Zuckerberg on the left and uh, to Elon Musk on the right, uh, who keep promising us that they're going to have a cage fight. Uh, the chances are that they'll probably end up getting robots to fight on their behalf. But they are the, one of the key, or a couple of the key drivers of a key change that we're seeing in the future of work. And that is this harnessing of artificial intelligence. You know, Facebook have recently uh, uh, introduced their Ray-Ban stories, these glasses that they've partnered with Ray-Ban to develop, where, you know, in their marketing, they talk about capturing life's best moments and live streaming to Instagram and Facebook from your glasses, which has a 12 MP, MP camera and a five mic system. So, so they're really saying to you, you know, you can put your phone in the pocket, but you can stay connected with all your calls, your messages, you can listen to music, um, and, and you wear these glasses, which are basically a form of artificial intelligence to, to boost your connectivity and your creativity all at the same time. Um, Zucker, uh, uh, sorry, Musk, on the other hand, um, he's produced Optimus, which he's suggesting is going to replace many people in the office um, uh, by being able to do many functional tasks 
Um, and at the sort of upgrade of Optimus uh, a couple of months ago, he displayed Optimus doing yoga to show how intelligent this creature is. So we're seeing this artificial intelligence rising dramatically. Um, another area where Musk has been driving it, excuse the pun, has been in the self-driving area where he has been promising for a very long time that he will perfect self-driving. Autonomous cars will definitely be a reality. A Tesla car next year will probably be 90% capable of autopilot. Like, so 90% of your miles could be on auto. You know, for sure, highway uh, travel. We're probably only a month away from having uh, autonomous driving, at least for highways and for relatively simple roads. Like a Model S and Model X at this point uh, can drive autonomously with greater safety than a person right now. Next question. End of next year, self-driving will be will encompass essentially all modes of driving and be at least 100 to 200 um, percent safer than a person by the end of next year. We're talking maybe 18 months from now. I feel very confident predicting uh, autonomous rover taxis for Tesla next year. I'm I'm extremely confident uh, of achieving full autonomy uh, and, and releasing it to the Tesla customer base uh, next year. When do you think Tesla will solve level four FSD? I mean, it's looking quite likely that it will be next year. So you can see the difficulty that we have with predicting the future. Even Elon Musk is struggling with that. Um, he still hasn't um, finessed the, the, the idea of uh, self-driving robo-taxis, but he's been promising it for a long time. Now, um, we've probably seen a, another side of Elon Musk with his, uh, what he's doing with, with X, previously Twitter. And so he's probably you know, putting a, a little bit of a, a downer on our perspective of him uh, as a genius. But certainly when it comes to artificial intelligence and chat GPT, you know, he, he was one of the founders of OpenAI, was a driver of ChatGPT. And so we have seen, despite his inability to predict the future about self-driving taxis, we have seen a remarkable impact from this generative intelligence that we are seeing through uh, systems like ChatGPT and BART, et cetera. And so the future of work is one of being mobile, being flexible, and being full of artificial intelligence. But what does that mean for us in our industry and in our work? I'm sure many of you have come across the idea of a rover advisor, have perhaps used them, perhaps used them in your businesses. Um, but what we can see here is the integration of this mobility, this flexibility, and this AI. And these tools are only going to get smarter. In other words, Clients are going to be able to engage with technology wherever they want to, whenever they want to, and be able to get good, sensible outcomes from their investment decisions, which I'm sure is what most people on this call are, are most interested in, but from broader financial planning and financial decisions. And so the obvious question that we have to ask ourselves, given this rise of technology and, and what the impact of that is having on us, is, you know, what is the impact on the financial planner? And, um, and the impact on the financial planner, I'm sure you would agree, begs this question. Is this the choice that clients will face going forward? I mean, in some, in some, some might argue that they're facing the choice now. But before I answer that question, um, I'm going to ask another question. And, and actually, uh, the first person to answer this question correctly on the chat group will get a free copy of, of my, my new book, which um, Anton mentioned at the start. I know I think 50 people are getting it anyway, the first 50 that signed up for the webinar, but uh, you might be able to get a bonus book now. So the question I have for you is, what tech business started out life with the name Kadabra? And if you know the answer to that question, please type it into the chat box. Um, and I should have given you a time a, a time limit because you probably can Google it. But Apple, Kevin, no, Apple is not the right answer. So that gives other people Adobe no. Okay, Amazon, that's the correct answer. Celeste Kruger, just so that you guys know, um, Anton, if you just know Celeste uh, gets a book. Um, yes, it was Amazon. Um, the interesting the in interesting backstory to that um, 
uh, and uh, was that Amazon started out with the, the name Kadabra, um, but uh, yeah, Jeff Bezos' uh, lawyer, when chatting to him over the phone, referred to it as Kadabra, and Bezos realized that there might be a problem with this name. The original name Kadabra came from Abra Kadabra and the magic that he was hoping to weave in the world. Um, and then anyway, he went on and then looked for another name and came across Amazon, which had many benefits to it. One, that it starts with A, so it comes at the top of the searches. And two, that, you know, the Amazon is a massive river, um, which uh, he was hoping to build a massive business. And why am I telling you the story at this point is because when we think about a question like this, is this the choice that clients will face? When we think about the future, in fact, Jeff Bezos has some advice for us. Because what Jeff Bezos says is he often gets the question, what's going to happen in the future? What's the future of work look like? And he says, that's not the right question to ask. You're not going to, you know, what's going to change is not, is not what's relevant. What he believes is relevant is what's not going to change in the future. And so he suggests that the question that we should ask ourselves when we think about the future impact of work on financial planning is not, what, not what's going to change, but what's not going to change. And my starting point in trying to address this question is to suggest to you that in the future, your clients will still be people. Now, that might sound like a, a trite um, comment, um, but it is a bit scary that the, the Weizmann Institute in Israel recently created a model of a human embryo without using male sperm or female egg. And we do have this term coming in around homo artificialis, where we are seeing a, an integration of things like biotechnology, nanotechnology, biology, and artificial intelligence all coming together. So even suggesting to you that your clients will still be people is risky, but I'm gonna put my head on a block and say, at least for the next generation, the clients of financial planners and investment managers will still be people. Now, why does Bezos say that we should focus on what's not going to change? Because if we use the example of Amazon, he says that when he looks at Amazon, there are three things that he believes won't change. People will want good quality products at a good price and delivered to their home or office. He says those three things are not going to change no matter what happens. But what has changed in his business, obviously, is how those products get to the clients. And as we've seen, for example, the use of drones to deliver parcels rather than DHL trucks, as an example. So with that in mind, I'm going to put it to you that given our, our clients will still be people, there are three things that won't change about our clients. The first is that they will have a relationship with money. The second is that they will have a unique personality. And the third is that by being human comes with a whole lot of realities which we can't change. And I'm just going to unpack each of these three elements briefly to give us a sense of what we can do as a result of this changing world that we're living in uh, from a financial planning and money management point of view. When it comes to a relationship with money, I always like to say that it is the longest relationship that we'll have with anything. We have a relationship with money when we're in our mother's womb. Um, we then have a relationship with money as we grow up through our teen years, through our early adult, through our adulthood, and as we get older, and we have a relationship with money after we die. When we die, there may be money left over that needs to be left as a legacy, and decisions need to be made around that. And obviously, why I emphasize the relationship with money is because in many ways, it has an unconscious impact with how we manage our money, how we do our own financial planning, how clients respond to financial planners. And so a critical element going forward is for financial planners to be exploring with their clients their relationship with money and the impact that that is having on how they're handling their money. So asking questions like, you know, what was your first memory of money? What was money like when you were growing up? What does money mean to you? All of those are reflective of our relationship with money. The second thing that is not going to change is that every human being will have a unique personality. No two human beings, not even identical twins, are the same. And this unique personality also drives 
decision making around money and financial planning. And sadly, until this point, our industry has done a very poor job of taking this personality into account. The most common tool that gets used is the risk profile. profile. And it's even you know, legislated that, that, that this should be used to help clients make investment decisions. But this is obviously very problematic because um, you know, whether I like bungee jumping or climbing high mountains or skydiving um, is irrelevant to what my financial circumstances are. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the point is, is that our personalities are far more complex than to think about risk profile. And in fact, I, I still ponder the question why we don't call it a return profile, given that people invest money for returns. But as you can see from this iceberg image, our behavior, which is above the iceberg, the behavior of your clients is driven by a multitude of factors. Their personality, which is underpinned by the defenses, the motivations that they have, their anxieties, their fears, Positive psychology talks about the fact that we're all born with an essence um, that is positive and that defines who we are uniquely. And when we want to assess a personality, there are a multitude of assessments that we can use to get to understand the human being below it. Things like the Enneagram, strength finders, learning styles, insights, etc. There are a range of assessments. And in my view, we don't use these assessments enough in the work of financial planning because if we're thinking about clients and focusing on them and really getting to understand them and what drives them, then having a deeper understanding of their personality would be very helpful and very productive. So the, 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 the relationship with money and the unique personality are things that are unique to each individual. But the third element that I believe won't change, that of being human, has some what I would call generic components to it. And the generic components to this means that we're all, all of us on this call, um, are prone to fall foul of the vagaries of being human. And, and I've captured these vagaries when it comes to our financial behavior and our investment behavior in what I like to call the Bermuda Triangle of financial behavior. And this Bermuda Triangle of financial behavior, I suggest, encompasses three elements, cognitive, social, and emotional pressures on us that influence our behavior. And, and very often, you know, we, we, we think about things like from a cognitive perspective, and I'm sure many people in the school are familiar with the idea that we all have biases and we, you know, we, we, we want to um, uh, sort of try and identify client biases so we can manage their behavior better. But very often the cognitive mistakes that we make, you know, are, are, are unconscious and we are completely unaware of them. And I'm going to give you one example here to just test your sense of to what extent you are aware of your own cognitive biases. This is a classic behavioral finance scenario. Linda is 31, outspoken, very bright, and uh, she got her college degree in philosophy, is deeply concerned about discrimination and other social issues, uh, and participates in anti-war demonstrations. The question that we want to ask you is, what statement is more likely to be true? Linda is a bank teller, then there's a bank teller and active in the feminist movement. And I'd really appreciate it if you wouldn't mind typing into the chat box whether you think the answer to that question is one or two. Is Linda a bank teller or is she a bank teller and active in the feminist movement? And so we're getting twos, we're getting ones. Uh, we're getting twos and ones. And I would suggest that uh, it's, it's almost looking like it's um, it's uh, equal, yeah. I, I would, from what I've just a quick scan of this is it's a 50-50. As you may or may not guess, as you look at this for longer, is that the, the, the only answer that can be correct, and Shannon's trying to be clever by saying it's three. Shannon, that's a good opt-out. But the only correct answer is that it is one. Because what we do know from those two statements is that Linda is a bank teller. And that's the only thing we know about her that is for sure. Whether she's active in the feminist movement or not is purely speculation. But the reason that most people choose two, so most people who do this um, little exercise choose two, and the reason we do it is because we get attached to words like philosophy, discrimination, social issues, um, and participates in anti-war demonstrations, and we draw conclusions from that information. 
And so that's the real challenge we face from a cognitive perspective, is that we often have so much information that confronts us that we, we do take shortcuts to try and make sense of it. And very often our shortcuts lead to incorrect answers. And so the first side of the Bermuda Triangle of financial behavior is this cognitive frailty that we have. The second side, and I don't need to tell this audience much about this, is the fact that emotions do drive investor behavior a lot. Um, and you can see the emotional ups and downs on this graph here, and that at the point of maximum financial risk, most people's emotions are extremely positive, and, and that's when they are most inclined to want to invest. And at the point of greatest despondency, at the point of maximum financial opportunity, most people want to sell. And so the emotional element, I'm sure, is familiar with everybody, which brings us to the third element, and that third element is social pressure. And uh, there was a great study done in the US uh, around social pressure. It took place in a gentleman's toilet. The image you see here is the image that a camera that was placed on the ceiling of the toilet um, showed, and it monitored the behavior of gentlemen going into this toilet. And once they had done their business, uh, basically assessing the extent to which they washed their hands after they had done their business. So the camera only filmed people at the wash basins. It didn't film them doing anything else. And again, in the chat box, do you want to guess, put an estimate in there for what percentage of men who went to the loo washed their hands after going to the loo? And uh, I, I don't want to be accused of discrimination here, um, but 30%, Stina Marie says, Jonathan, 15, 10, yeah, somebody, Janine's optimistic at 50, Shannon, uh, somebody said 100, I knew who that was. The point is, it was around about 20% of people, which is a bit scary. But then what they did was, they then placed just a, 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 an arbitrary person standing in the loo, around about the wash basins, sort of looking like he was about to wash his hands, um, not really doing anything, but he was a presence in the room. And gentlemen came in, did their business, and what happened to the hand washing rate after this person's presence was there? Do you want to now tell me what the percentage washing rate? Andre, 85%, absolutely. Shannon, 85, 90%. Yeah, exactly right. So it went up to north of 80%. And so it's a very simple study to show how dramatic we as human beings respond to social pressure. And I don't need to tell anybody on this call uh, how significant that can be and how that social pressure that you see at the top of the Bermuda Triangle of financial behavior has a huge impact on the behavior of clients. So what we have then is, is that when working with clients, if they're going to be human beings, we really need to be able to work with our clients' relationship with money, with their unique personalities, and with the foibles of being human as captured in that Bermuda Triangle of financial behavior. And, and the reason why it's important for us to do this work is because the reality of being human is that it impacts on the returns that our clients get from their investments. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Dalbar study on investor behavior, which over 30 years to the end of 2021 has shown that the behavioral penalty that investors basically get from behaving badly is over three and a half percent per annum. And you compound that and it's a significant drawback on the returns that they get. And so whilst if human beings could behave sensibly, they could achieve returns like those offered by the S&P 500, but because they don't uh, behave sensibly, that many and, and the average investor uh, underachieves their investments in which they're invested. And so what we can see is that because our clients are human beings, the one area that we can really make a difference to them is in helping them avoid this dramatic cycle. And it's, and it's because of this that Maya Statman, the leading, leading behavioral economist, talks about the fact that 93.6% of the financial planning process is the behavioral management of clients. Now, the reason he uses that number is because he was using that number in response to the finding of Brinson about the uh, impact of asset allocation um, on, on investor returns and how asset allocation attributes sort of 93.6% of returns to investors. 
he's suggesting actually, it's actually the behavioral management of clients. Uh, and, and what does that mean for us? Well, it means that you, you have somebody like Nick Murray, who's a leading financial planner in the US, um, uh, who's written a couple of books, one called Simple Wealth, another called Behavioral Investment Counseling. And he talks about the fact that as a financial planner, he earns his fee in only, from only two activities. The first is quantifying goals and crafting a long-term plan and funding the plan with a long-term portfolio. And then the second is coaching clients to continue working the plan through all the cycles of the economy. And that coaching of the clients talks to Mayer Statman's idea that this is all about behavioral management. What Nick Murray is saying is that he earns 0% for trying to analyze the economy or interpret it. He earns zero for trying to time the market and he, and he earns zero for trying to identify consistently top performing investments. So there's an example of a financial planner who's embraced this idea that financial planning is about the behavioral management of clients. Now that's all good and well. The problem is that there's research to show that clients actually don't want that. Morningstar conducted research looking at what investors want and what advisors think that they want and what investors value about advisor services. And what was interesting about the study, and they looked at 15 attributes of financial advisors and the top five attributes probably would uh, come as no surprise to you. Clients wanted financial advisors to help them reach their financial goals, to help them have relevant skills and knowledge, communicate and explain financial concepts well, Interesting, number four, help, help me maximize my returns and then have a good reputation and positive renew. So those are the top five attributes that clients wanted from financial advisors. What they ranked at the bottom is what is really interesting because we've seen the extent to which emotions play a part in undermining client investments and yet clients don't see the role of a financial planner as helping them stay in control of their emotions and nor do they see the role of a financial planner as a coach or a mentor to keep them on track, which would contradict what um, Nick Murray is saying is, is the role. So what are we to make of this contradiction? Well, we can look for some wisdom from another man who has certainly made a big contribution to this future world of work that we are moving towards. And Steve Jobs said, some people say, give the customers what they want, but that's not my approach. Our job is to figure out what they're going to want before they do. And what Jobs is suggesting to us is that potentially clients actually don't know what they need from a financial planning perspective and what's good for them. Steve Jobs didn't go out asking people if they wanted an iPad or an iPhone. He developed it because he felt that it would make a big difference in their lives. And so too then, if we look at the real work of a financial planner and we take the, the words of Don Phillips who after 25 years in the industry working for Morningstar said, we are not in the money management business, we're in the behavior modification business. So if we believe that, you know, how do we get our clients to believe it? Because this notion that the work of a financial planner going forward is around behavior modification is being reinforced from many sides. Uh, Morningstar, I mean, sorry, not Morningstar, Vanguard did a study in 2014, looking at the value added by financial advisors to the portfolios of clients. And they estimated that about 3% per annum was being added um, to client portfolios through the various activities that financial planners uh, engage in, but that the biggest value add was from behavioral coaching. And this study, and that there they reckon it's half of the value. So one and a half percent, 150 basis points added through behavioral coaching. Russell did a more recent study in 2021, and they estimate that the value from behavioral coaching is around 2% per annum to clients. But whatever that number is, I think the future is best captured by this statement from Michael Kitsis, who talks about the fact that the future of financial planning is not about dispensing expert financial advice, but helping clients engage in financial behavior change. That expert financial advice, increasingly we're gonna be able to get from things like ChatGPT and BART. We'll be able to just ask the question, what should we do in this situation? And we're gonna get a very nice technical answer from them. We may be not there yet, but it's coming and it's coming fast. So if the role of the financial planner is not about the technical expertise, then the question we have to ask ourselves is if we're gonna influence financial behavior, how do we do that? How do we get clients to change their behavior? Because what we do know is that the industry has struggled to do this. As Dalbar has pointed out, 
We've spent lots of money trying to educate people about investments, about how to behave, and yet imprudent action continues to be widespread. And so the question is, what can we do? And that brings me to a story that I like to tell about a client of a financial planner. Her name is Rose. For the purposes of the story, it's not really Rose. But Rose basically went to see her financial planner three or four years before she was due to retire. She was working for a listed technology company in 1999 and was thinking about her retirement. And I'm sure most of you on the school will know that in 1999, we were in the throes of a technology bubble. Tech share prices were at all time highs. And when this financial planner looked at Rose's portfolio, he found that basically 90% of her retirement assets were in one share, the share of her employer. And if I had to say to you, what was her financial planner's advice to her? I'm guessing, and you can type it into the chat box to maybe just double check, if you were advising Rose and you discovered that 90% of her retirement assets are in one share, um, what would you tell her to do? And the answer would be to diversify, which is what her financial planner did. And yet Rose didn't take that advice and ended up um, six months later having her retirement savings decimated by the collapse as a result of the tech bubble. And so what we see here is that whenever you're sitting with a client, there's often a paradox between what they really need and what they want. And we saw that with the Morningstar research as well. So if we think about a paradox, um, and one specifically shared recently by Carl Richards, who many of you will know is the cartoon guy and a financial planner as well. And he talked about the fact that he knows many people have more money than they will ever need, but are totally insecure. But he also knows people who have almost nothing, but are totally secure. And so what he's suggesting is that when it comes to money and financial planning, that security is a feeling, not a number. Um, and, and I'm sure many of you on this call have got clients who some feel secure despite a lack of money and others are uh, anxious uh, despite the amount of money they have. And, and as we think about this conundrum or this paradox that Carl Richards has highlighted, it brings me to Kay Hay, who was a hedge fund manager uh, who worked on Wall Street uh, and by his mid-30s had basically realized his life dreams. He had made more than enough money than he thought he would ever make. He had status, he had a you know, nice apartment, uh, and basically had fulfilled his dreams. And yet, he uses the term, he was comfortably numb. Uh, deep down, he was numb, and he felt like the rest of his life, he was just going to go through the motions. And so he became a guru on financial freedom. And, and, and what he suggested is that all of us are, at the end of the day, seeking financial security. And this, this concept is definitely reinforced by research of clients around the world. And so we all want financial security from our money but we also want to live our lives well. And what Kay Hay is suggesting is that the real challenge we face is in order to live with our, live our lives well, we have to deal with what he calls the messy middle. And in that messy middle, you have things like, what is my purpose? What relationships are important in my life? My emotions, how much is enough? Am I happy, am I not happy? And so there's a whole lot of messiness there that we need to deal with if we are going to really help clients achieve what I like to call true financial health, which is about a balance between your life and your money. And this concept of financial health was captured by Sarah Newcomb, again, another Morningstar study in which she looked at the idea that financial health has two dimensions. And in their research, they found that the first dimension, economic stability, is not what you would think it is. It's not about how much money you've got. It's about how precise and specific you can be about your future and about how much you're going to need in the future uh, as opposed to having lots and lots. And so being clear and the clearer you can be over the longer the term, the greater your economic stability. But she also says that balancing that is psychological well-being. And here, the psychological well-being that, that they discovered was important from their research 
was that people feel empowered or in control of their financial situation. Again, not depending on how much money they've got, but how much control they feel they have. And that's not to say you don't work with a financial planner, but it's to say that when a client is working with a financial planner, the financial planner ideally would engage with that client in a way that lets that person feel like they're empowered or in control. So in Rose's case, what could her advisor have done differently? Well, not to focus on the money side of things. In other words, not to focus on the shares and the importance of diversification, but really to focus on Rose and her relationship with her company, her shares, her retirement, and get her to feel like she has some sense of autonomy and empowerment over her life. And the challenge that, that this financial planner faced was that he went straight to the money, gave good advice, sound advice, Rose didn't take it. And so Rose didn't take it because of that um, lack of attention to the psychological well-being, which is such an important part of financial health. So how do we do that practically? Well, in essence, when you meet with a client, and this is the client on the left with the money and life dilemmas bubble, when you meet with a client as the financial planner sitting on the right, you often want to basically give them advice, give them a solution, because that's what they've come to you for. But what we saw with Rose as the example is that the advice and solution didn't land. Instead, what we really want to be doing if we're going to be working with the person is to consider not the solution to their money and life dilemmas, but to focus on them and help them unpack their relationship with their money and life dilemmas. You know, so that, for example, in the case of Rose, if a financial planner had had a conversation with about what, what does the picture of a retirement look like? He might have discovered that actually she wants to go and farm on a small holding and she wants to grow organic vegetables and live a simple life. And that if he had been able to show to her the risk to that life that she was going to lead by hanging on to that share, he may not have even had to use the word diversify because he would have been able to just say, we'll put something together that gives you greater certainty of achieving that outcome. What he didn't do is he didn't deal with the reality that she was very attached to the share because she had worked there for 26 years. She had got divorced during that time. And the one source of stability in her life was the share that the financial advisor was trying to get her to sell. And so what he was doing, he was focusing on the number and ignoring the feeling. And so the challenge that we face is going forward with all this technology, we're going to have the number sorted out very easily. Our challenge is to resolve the client's feelings and work with them. And obviously one of the ways that we can do that is to connect with a feeling. And if we connect with that feeling, we can then see that the number will follow on. Now that's putting it very simply. Um, and, and it's actually why I wrote this book, The Seven Pillars of Financial Health, because I believe there are actually seven key elements or key skills that we need to work on human skills, one of them being connection to enable clients to thrive financially, both from a life and a money perspective. And so I believe that the future, because of the way it's going, because of the power of artificial intelligence, the power of technology, the future for financial planners will be being human as your superpower. That if we develop those skills and hone those skills as humans, we will be very, very important in the lives of our clients um, and we will have a very bright future going forward as long as our clients remain human beings. I'm going to end there. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm going to, to hand back to, to um, Anton to see what questions have come up, if any. Thanks, Rob. That was, that was fantastic. Um, please um, put any questions you have into the, into the chat or the Q&A pop-up. Um, I'll, um, I'll just get us started. I think probably maybe we are a little bit kind of over time, Rob. So I'll just maybe use five to 10 minutes for questions. Uh, I'll get us started, so started with a couple. I mean, you've touched on it, but when you talked at the beginning around how, you know, things have changed in the last four years, um, around work from home, around, you know, doing a webinar like this, which would have been, you know, we wouldn't have done this four years ago. We all been sitting in a, in a lecture hall. Um, how has that impacted the actual how's that changed the relationship element of how advisors and clients interact? Um, and what are the, 
what are the kind of positives that you've seen and also some of the some of the things that we're still battling with from that perspective yeah. i mean i think uh, uh, and on some of the positives in that regard is uh, i suppose is greater efficiency within financial planning businesses so you you you're seeing that um one doesn't have to you know, travel either the client or the financial planner, travel great distances to meet because you can do it via technology. And you've also seen almost a, a, a de-geographing. I don't know if that's the right term, um, but basically ge geography is no longer uh, a, a, an indicator of your client base. So as a financial planner, you're not you're not limited by your geography any longer. So, you know, um, yep. you, you know financial planners are able to work across different jurisdictions, even countries, et cetera. So that's one positive, another positive. Um, and then also, I think that some people prefer meeting virtually. You know, some people like a little bit of a, a distance between them. But I've also seen financial planning businesses who have said they couldn't get back to meeting with their clients in person soon enough. And that they really, you know, hinge on and depend on that. So I think it is about, you know, horses for courses and for client for financial planning businesses to decide, you know, what is their real value proposition? What do their clients really want from them? So um, I, I mean, I, I think there's positives and negatives to it. And I, but I'm not, I can't be sort of more specific than that or give you any sort of mm. stats or data on it. Um, but I just think that uh, I suppose the other part of it is to say is that. Um, you know, it, it, I, I believe it's enhanced financial planning, you know, and it's and it's and the, and the potential offering of financial planning hugely. Great. I mean, there's, a, there's actually a follow up um, question that's come on the on the chat, which is, do you think that human that the human connection can be achieved online? <laughs> um, yeah. So yes, I, I, I do. So I think the simple answer is yes, and I and I do know financial planners who have um, taken on new clients simply on, on online, so virtually, so never met the clients in person. I do believe it is, I mean, as we know, trust is the currency of financial advice, you know, so so I, I do believe it's possible for us to to build trust virtually. Um, and uh, and so absolutely. I do think though that one, you know, the skills that, that I talk about, those human skills, they need to be applied in a virtual environment as well. You know, so if we talk about connection, We've got to work on connection virtually. You know, it doesn't just happen. Um, uh, and so it's still about developing those human skills. But absolutely, yes, you, I, I believe you can achieve it online. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. The the uh, the topic of the kind of the the behavioural biases. I mean, mm -hmm. it's something which is you know kind of obviously in the in the in the world of investing is something which we are, are all super guilty of and and mm -hmm. um, happens everywhere. From a I mean, you talked about it from the client perspective. We know it from an investing perspective, from the the financial advisor's perspective, because yeah. the same behavioral biases could exist in terms of it's almost like a like a psychologist in a sense, financial psychologist. <laughs> that's the right, right way to yeah, describe yeah. it. Whereby you're not you're not trying to impose your view, but how does that how do, how does that kind of how does a kind of a financial advisor think around, you know, eliminating those biases? And then how does that tie up with what you said, you know, in that, that comment from Steve Jobs about ultimately giving them what you think they want as opposed to what they say they want? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a great question, Anton. I mean, we could we could do another webinar on this topic. <laughs> but I, I think that I mean, a couple of observations. I mean, the, the reality is, is that, I do quite a lot of work with financial planners around developing what I call behavioral coaching skills. And 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 some of the people on some of the programs I run are on the school, and I'm sure that they would vouch for the fact that much of the work we do is self-development work. So you're absolutely spot on that you've got no hope of influencing a client's biases if you haven't worked on your own and have not become aware of your own. So so we spend, you know, much of our work is, is working on oneself. So, because for example, you know, if I take myself as an example, you know, I, I you know, I, I'm a conservative guy, you know, I'm risk averse. Um, you know, if I'm going to give somebody advice, then, you know, I can't allow that to influence the advice I give because I've got to give advice that actually is relevant to what the person that I'm sitting across the table from really needs, you know, and they might need high growth assets, you know, going balls to the wall in a sense. 
um, for a long time, you know, whereas my sort of intuitive personal perspective might be different from that. So you're absolutely spot on in that regard that, that and, and I maybe didn't make the point which I should make here is that those three elements that I spoke about relationship with money, our own personality, and the Bermuda Triangle of financial behavior, they all affect us as financial planners. And so we have to come to terms with all that. You know, there's no point in working with a client on their relationship with money if we haven't worked on our own relationship with money and have not conscientized ourselves. And, and we've seen and we see it unfortunately in the statistics on the on the platforms. You know, we see poor investor behavior, but about the much of that behavior is is with advised clients. You know, so so we can't blame just blame the client because often clients are switching under advice. Um, and that brings me, in, and, and I'll, if I don't mind me saying, I mean, one of, the, one of the skills that I believe financial planners need to have, and it's in my book, is courage. And it, and it requires courage to actually tell a client, no, we're not going to cash in because you're nervous of the markets. It requires courage to say, we're staying invested, we've got a plan. So it's not, I'm not saying it's easy, it's, it's very hard, but I think we've got to do more of that. Because what's going to happen if we don't is that clients are just going to become their own worst enemies because they, with the technology available, they're going to be able to just switch whenever they want. You know, it's going to be a free for all. And I think their outcomes are going to be worse, you know? Yeah. I mean, how does that, I mean, it kind of links to the, the, the this point around the, the, the doing nothing. You know, you've got a plan. We know that investing often doing nothing is the best thing you can, you, you, you can do. Mm -hmm. But that does therefore imply well, what is the value that 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 I'm getting here? And once I have a plan in place, um, is there is there any need um, for me to be spending time with my my advisor? Um, how does that that kind of reconcile with the value prop, like the value proposition? I guess in 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 terms of of just given the world we live in, whereby all clients are you know everyone's just got so much going on and so many things and 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 so much news flow. And they're like, how does the do nothing and the model work, um, you know, to to kind of demonstrate that value, right? Yeah, no, so I think, great question. I think that the challenge that we face with financial advice, unlike, for example, the medical profession, is that the advice that a client gets today, often the wisdom of that advice is only felt 10, 20, 30 years time. Um, or it could be felt when, you know, suddenly something unexpected happens and suddenly now that life policy you took out actually is needed. So, so it's very hard to predict. Whereas if I go and see the doctor, you know, I'll know within a week or two whether those pills he prescribed me are working or not. Um, and so that makes financial advice very hard for advisors and for clients, which then talks to what you're saying is what is the value that you're bringing? And, and you saw that slide I showed from Nick Murray around the coaching. What does that mean? Well, it means that probably the most profound influence on a client's experience of financial advice is the communication that they have with their financial planner. You know, so, so that, I mean, the research shows that that is the biggest influence on, on a client's perception of advice is that communication. And that communication really does need to happen on an ongoing basis. So, the, so whilst doing nothing might be the thing that happens for five years, Hopefully, communication is happening on a regular basis, but however it gets done, you know, whether it's done virtually, whether it's done in person, but that the client is aware, is kept up to date, and that you know that you that that, that they know that you're there, thinking of them. So um, it, it's a um, it's a tough one, but the the financial planning value proposition um, is is an ongoing value proposition. You know, um, I was chatting to a financial planner yesterday. You sometimes clients aren't aware of changes that have happened. They, they need to be prompted. I know in my case, my financial plan has got to kick my butt, you know, otherwise I wouldn't do anything. So, so it's about shifting again, the focus on me as the human being. Your proposition is to help me as a person. Your proposition isn't, I mean, I can, you know, I could go to 10X tomorrow and take out investment and, and be sorted, you know. That's not the proposition of a financial planner. The proposition is help me as a human being to live a good life to look after my money, to look after my life, help me make decisions. I mean, I, I like to say that, that financial planning is a process of helping clients make decisions about their money and their life and implementing those decisions. And, and implementation means that there's an ongoing process. Um, it's not just a once-off, you know, take out the investment and let's do nothing. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, we, we we kind of are over time, so I'm going to I'm going to just kind of ask one one last question. It's probably it's actually almost an impossible question to answer. So apologies for finishing <laughs> off with a tough one. But you touched on um, generative AI, um, and the the question which is impossible to answer because we the, the pace of this is so is you know so fast. Mm -hmm. If we look, if we kind of sitting here in three years time, um, what's changed for a financial advisor in terms of how they engage engage with their clients what is what is generative ai um how, how could that fundamentally change that engagement so I'm, 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 the picture that i have in my head is that uh and it, i don't know whether it'll be three years it might be sooner it might be later but the picture i have in my head is that on an interpersonal basis when a financial planner meets with a client all they'll need all they'll have there next to sitting them in the office will be a screen and they'll have a conversation, and whenever there is something that it, some form of information is required, they'll just ask the screen to tell them. So, in other words, you know, Anton, okay, let's look at your RA now. Let's see what the what you know what the portfolio's value is. Let's see what your asset allocation is. As a financial planner, I won't have had to go before the meeting to prepare, prep all of that information, which happens now. I will be able to sit in the meeting and say to my my uh, chat GPT, you know. Um, Tell us what Anton's RA looks like now, and it'll just come up on the screen. So my view is, is that the, the future is going to be so much more about human interaction um, and so much less about, you know, getting information, analyzing information, because all of that stuff's going to be done, as you say, by this, which, which I mean, we don't know where it's going to go. Um, but yeah, that, that would be one answer to your question. I, I think that, you know, we won't have paper. We might have paper to draw pictures and but, but we're going to be talking about your life, talking about what's going on for you. And then every now and again, we'll when we need to get information, we'll say, what's your 10x portfolio valued at today? And and it'll just come up on the screen. You know, anyway, that's yeah. that's what I think is going to happen. One of the things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's I guess the thing which is the game changer is the ability for artificial intelligence to think 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 for itself and ultimately just link to that discussion we had around the behavioral biases you know yeah. you know things like creativity and new creating new um um you know new products and 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 new things that kind of like almost that ultimately is the is the bit that we don't know uh, you know in in the investment industry and how ultimately that element of thinking can ultimately help with the behavioral biases as well yeah, I mean, I think you I think yeah, I think yeah. Well, what we don't know is the extent to which the yeah the technology will prompt the behavior of the client, and and yeah. you know, uh, and and I suppose what what we maybe you know what what I think technology is is not going to solve for a while. It might solve the problem, but it is about that emotional connection. So if I just want some reassurance that it's going to be okay, uh, just from a human being emotionally. Um, at the moment, I get that from another human being. Mm -hmm. You know, whether if tech can do that, if tech can give me that, then you know, then we might all have to go and look for another job, <laughs> or just sit on the beach. <laughs> you know. Yeah, let's hope not. Excellent, Rob. Let's let's uh, let's close it off there. Um, uh, thank you, thank you so much for that presentation and 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 the answers and all. It's fascinating. Um, We'll send across a, a, an email to 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 all of you. Post this one with the, with the recording. Uh, there'll also be a, a link to Rob's book. There's a 20% discount on, on the book. Um, so please click on that. And as Rob mentioned, the first 50 individuals to sign up received a free copy of that. So um, that's that's great news. And yeah, Rob, just we'll finish off by saying thank you once again. And um, appreciate your time and appreciate your input. Great. Pleasure. Thank Thanks. you very much, Anton. I enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Thank you. And thank you for everyone who, who joined us today. Um, have a great Christmas break ahead. Thank you. Cheers.